Good morning. My name is Chris Melendez. I'm the vice president of the senior class. Hello, students and guests. Welcome to this very special event. We would like to take a moment and introduce our guest speaker, who was born in South Africa and is an Indian American, social, political, activist, speaker, author, and agent of change. He is the fifth grandson of legendary leader Muhammad Gandhi. Good morning. My name is Peyton Manor Howard and I'm the president of the senior class. Mr. Arun Gandhi is a very popular speaker on college campuses and has traveled to China, France, and Japan and many other countries around the world. In recent years, he has shared his grandfather's message with government officials such as President Clinton. His programs have changed his life for over half a million people in over 300 villages around the world and they still continue to grow today. Be the change you want to see in the world. Good morning. My name is Brandon Justin, and our speaker today has dedicated his life to being the change he wants to see in the world. Mr. Gandhi founded the Gandhi Worldwide Education Institute, a nonprofit organization that works to realize the vision of his historic namesake. The Institute's mission is to help individuals and communities develop the inner resources and particular skills needed to achieve a nonviolent, sustainable, and just world. The M.K. Gandhi Institute of Nonviolence is located at the University of Rochester. He has several, several honorary degrees and has participated in notable interfaith activities. Mr. Gandhi has dedicated his life to continuing the work of his grandfather, Mahatma Gandhi Singh. Good morning. It is my great honor and privilege to introduce Mr. Arun Gandhi. Please give him a warm welcome. Uh, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here this evening, this morning. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I know you all sent me a lot, a list of questions, and I'm going to try and answer them as much as possible. As you were told in the introduction, I was born and brought up in South Africa at a time when there was a lot of prejudice in that country, um, and I was abused and beaten up and bullied all all through my teenage years because I didn't fit into any color scheme. Uh, the whites thought I was too black and the blacks thought I was too white and so I was beaten up from both the groups there and, and bullied and it filled me with a lot of rage and you know normal thing wanted revenge, wanted to fight back again and I went to the gymnasium and started exercising and pumping iron so that I could be big and strong and be able to fight back again. And that is when, at the age of 12, my parents took me to India 
and gave me the opportunity to live with grandfather. And the first lesson that grandfather taught me was about understanding the anger and being able to use that energy constructively and uh, positively rather than abusing uh, anger. He said anger is like electricity. It's just as useful and just as powerful, but only if we use it intelligently. But it can be just as deadly and destructive if we abuse it. So just as we channel electrical energy and bring it into our lives and use it for the good of humanity, we must learn to channel anger in the same way so that we can use that energy for the good of humanity rather than abuse the energy and cause death and destruction. He suggested that I write an anger journal. He said, every time you get angry about something, don't act on it, don't say anything or do anything that is going to change the course of your life. But write a journal. But write the journal with the intention of finding a solution to the problem and then commit yourself to finding a solution. Now that is very important because today a lot of people tell me they've been writing an anger journal for a long time, but it hasn't really helped very much because what they did was just pour their anger out into the journal. So every time they go back and read the journal, they're just reminded of the incident and they get angry all over again. So we don't want the journal to be a reminder of the incident. We want the journal to help us find a, an equitable solution to the problem. So it's very important that we write the journal with the intention of finding a solution and then commit ourselves to finding a solution. I did this for many years and I must say it helped me considerably in learning how to deal with my anger positively and constructively. One of the reasons that I have dedicated my life to doing this work and going and talking with all of you is trying to bring about that understanding between people that we are all the same. We may look different, we may have different color and all that, but we are all human beings and we need to respect each other as human beings. And I emphasize the word respect because today a lot of people talk about tolerance. And I don't think that's a very positive word. I, I, I cringe every time I hear that word tolerance. Because we don't want to tolerate people. We want people to respect each other. Tolerance means that we can all be in this room together because we are all different races and different colors. But we don't need to respect each other. And that's not the kind of relationship we want. We want a relationship where we respect each other, understand each other, and treat each other as human beings. And that is a very significant part of his philosophy of nonviolence. Learning how to build better relationships. So let me first, before I talk about relationships, may, let me stress this fact that a lot of people seem to think nonviolence is a weapon, is a strategy to be used in certain conflict resolutions. It's not a strategy, it's not a weapon, it's a way of life. You have to believe in it, you have to live it, and you have to practice it. Only then will it be perfect. And that is where the whole concept of relationship comes in. Today, our relationships with each other are based on selfishness. We are always thinking about what am I going to gain from that relationship, and if I don't gain anything from it, why should I bother to have a relationship? And that's a very selfish way of building a relationship. Ideally, a relationship is one based on the four principles of respect, understanding, acceptance, and appreciation. We have to respect ourselves and respect each other and respect our connection with all of creation. You know, we are not independent individuals. We are part of this whole creation. We are a part of this whole world. And whatever we do affects the world and whatever the world does affects us. It's a mutual relationship there. And we've got to respect that. And it's only through respecting that 
that we then understand who we are and what we are and why are we here on earth. We are not here by accident. We are not here to while away our time from birth to death. We are here for a purpose. Each one of us is here for a purpose. But because we don't know what that purpose is, we just flounder around and do our own thing from morning till night and by the end of the life we don't uh, know what we have achieved or what we have contributed to, to the community. So we have to understand our purpose in life. And when we understand that purpose in life, then we will appreci appreciate each other and we will be able to build a relationship that is based on mutual respect for each other and not tolerance for each other. And that is when we will then be able to un appreciate our own humanity. So these are the principles on which uh, nonviolence relationship uh, is built with. We can, you know, uh, one of the most important things that I think we learned, uh, at least I learned from my grandfather, was about the depth and the breadth of his philosophy of nonviolence. Now, until then, I thought nonviolence, like everybody else, that nonviolence is a weapon, it's a tool, we use it for conflict resolution, and after that we don't care about it. But through a little pencil, a little three-inch butt of a pencil, he taught me a profound lesson, a lesson that I'll never forget. I threw away a pencil because I thought it was too small for me to use. And I was so sure that grandfather would give me a new pencil when I asked him for one. But that evening when I met grandfather and asked him for a pencil to do my homework with, instead of giving me one, he subjected me to a lot of questions. He wanted to know how the pencil became small and where did I throw it away and why did I throw it away and on and on. And I couldn't understand why he was making such a fuss over a little pencil until he told me to go out and look for it. And I said, you must be joking. I said, you don't expect me to look for a little pencil in the dark? He said, oh, yes, I do. Here's a flashlight. <laughs> and he sent me out with a flashlight, and I must have spent about two hours searching for that pencil. And when I finally found it and brought it to him, he said, now I want you to sit here and learn two very important lessons. The first lesson is that even in the making of a simple thing like a pencil, we use a lot of the world's natural resources. And when we throw them away, we are throwing away the world's natural resources. And that is violence against nature. And the second lesson is that because in an affluent society we can afford to buy all these things in bulk, we overconsume the resources of the world. And because we overconsume them, we are depriving people elsewhere of these resources and they have to live in poverty. And that is violence against humanity. And that is when I realized that all of these little things that we do every day, consciously and unconsciously, things that we overconsume or waste or throw away because we have so much of it, that every time we indulge in any of those actions, we are indulging in violence. And then he made me draw a genealogical tree of violence. You know how we do a family tree? We have the grandparent and then the parent and so on. It just keeps building. He made me draw a similar tree of violence with violence as the grandparent and physical violence and passive violence is the two branches. And every day before I went to bed, I had to analyze and examine everything that I had experienced during the day. Things that I may have done to other people or people may have done to me. Everything had to be analyzed and examined and put in their appropriate places on that tree. If it's physical violence where we use physical force, you know, kicking and beating and punching and slapping and murders and rapes and wars and, and all of these things where we use physical force against each other. 
that goes under physical violence. But if it's the kind of violence where we don't use any physical force, sometimes we are not even close to the person we have hurt today, but our actions have hurt them. Like discrimination or looking down on people or, you know, the hundreds of things we do, oh, con wasting food. For instance, I read in the New York Times not too long ago that in the United States alone, we throw away $20 billion worth of food every year. $20 billion worth of food goes into the garbage every year. When there are so many people dying of hunger around the world, and even in our own country here, there are so many people who don't get enough to eat. Now that is a form of violence. If we have so much of it and we just throw it away and we have no uh, concern for people who don't have any food, all that is passive violence. And then he explained to me, you know, I was amazed when I did this introspection for nearly a few months, five or six months, and I was able to fill up a whole wall in my room with acts of passive violence. He explained to me the connection between the two. He said, we commit passive violence all the time, every day, consciously and unconsciously, and that generates anger in the victim, and the victim then resorts to physical violence to get justice. So it is passive violence that fuels the fire of physical violence. So logically, if we want to put out that fire of physical violence and create peace, we have to cut off the fuel supply. And since the fuel supply comes from each one of us, we have to become the change we wish to see in the world. If we don't change our habits, our attitudes, our relationships, our uh, all of these things, we will never be able to create peace in the world. We have created a whole culture of violence, a culture of violence that has dominated every aspect of our life. Our language has become violent, our relationships are violent, our uh, entertainment is violent, our sports is violent, everything about us is violent. And it's in that culture of violence that we are trying to create peace. How can you create peace when you're living in that culture of violence? The only way we can create peace is by changing that culture of violence into a culture of non-violence. And that doesn't mean weakness. It doesn't mean that you become a doormat and let everybody walk over you. Because violence needs more courage than nonviolent. I'm sorry, nonviolence needs more courage to practice than violence does. So it, it's important that we understand these uh, issues and, uh, and make it a part of our life. But the thing that he taught me and, and that affected me the most, that our education does not begin and end in schools. Our education is a lifelong process. In schools you get textbook education, but in life you get education of experience. And you can learn from that experience and education only if you have an open mind a mind willing to absorb from uh, life's experiences. But if you think that you have given up, uh, you have done your uh, education in school, now you go out in life and enjoy life and don't learn anything from it, then you stagnate. Then our education is incomplete. So we have to have that open mind and that willingness to learn from every situation. I have learned from my grandfather this lesson and ever since then I've kept a very open mind. So every day, everybody I meet, every experience that I have, I learn something from it. It's sometimes something good and sometimes something bad. 
but because I know how to differentiate between the two, I reject the bad and absorb the good. And that is what all of us need to do. Only then do we broaden our perspective, then we consider ourselves to be truly educated and, and uh, uh, a true human being. Otherwise, we just uh, become like uh, uh, machines, just going about our work every day without any real feelings or, or any uh, concern about where we are going uh, in our life uh, and what we are doing. Like I said earlier, we are all in, you know, interdependent and interconnected and interrelated. And we have to accept that and understand that. And it's only through that acceptance and understanding that we will be able to build a, a proper society, a proper community where there is harmony between people, where we can all live together and, and be happy together and, and uh, help each other in their uh, days of difficulty. Now these are things that we have to learn and practice and make it a part of our life. Then nonviolence will be meaningful and become uh, a, a tool for peace in this world. But otherwise we'll just, you know, flounder from one crisis to another and um, the, uh, our humanity will disappear. So these are a few lessons, uh, and I hope I've been able to answer all your questions uh, through this. And uh, you asked me to bring something uh, of his personal um, belonging, and I got these two metal cups. The bigger one is my grandfather's cup, and the smaller one is my mother's glass. In those days, they used metal uh, glasses like this to drink their liquids in because glass was very expensive and not very practical uh, in, in that kind of so they use these metal ones and now I've inherited them and treasure them uh, and the other box that you see there is the spinning wheel I'd like to demonstrate that uh, you know, he discovered the spinning wheel to spin cotton because at that time in India, the British were taking away the Indian cotton to England, processing it, making cloth, and bringing the cloth back to, the, uh, to India and selling it at a very exorbitant price. And that uh, impoverished the people of India and to the extent that many people just couldn't afford to buy clothes and so they had the minimum clothes and would just wear a little, um, you know, sheet-like thing around their waist and, and uh, minimum clothing they would win. So grandfather decided that political independence in India will make sense only if there is economic independence along with it. And so to make the people of India self-sufficient in producing their own cloth. He invented this uh, machine which makes cotton thread. And uh, it's so simple to use that even children could uh, make cotton thread. And then this cotton thread would be sent to uh, another uh, family who would make, turn it into cloth. And this is a cloth from uh, cotton that was spun at home by me. So, and, and you know, you, this is just a handkerchief, but you could make your shirts and trousers and, and everything that you needed from that. So, I just want to demonstrate that to you. <coughs> need some help then. Not the table. Oh, the actual wheel. Isn't there another? 
Is there another one on this side? No. Can you all see? See the inside? See the inside? This is what it looks like on the inside. Does anyone want to come up and hold this down? It needs to be. Yeah. Uh, turn up, and then I'll get out of the way, and you can. So, because it moves around and it spins, so you just need to hold so it. So, just hold yeah. it? Yeah. Okay. You'll have to hold it tighter. Hold it tight? <laughs> yeah, because it's moving. Can you all see? This is how people made cotton thread, and that thread was turned into cloth. How are we doing with time? Okay. We still have some time? Oh. Additional questions? Well, we have questions. Yeah. Well, we have 25 minutes. You can ask questions. Yes, there was someone I wanted to address. What is the most cherished moment that you and your grandfather shared? I think every moment with him was a cherished moment. Um, you know, I lived with him uh, towards the end of his life when uh, everything was coming to a boil. Everything that he worked for and stood for in India was going to get independent, but in India was going to be divided into India and Pakistan, and there was a lot of unhappiness over that and uh, fighting and a lot of killing, and he was in the midst of all of this thing. But in spite of that, he decided he was going to spend an hour with me every day. And he uh, did that religiously. Every day between four and five was my time. And whatever he was doing, he would give up that and come out and spend that one hour with me. Just be a grandfather, would tell me stories, tell me, uh, help me with lessons. And uh, just, you know, that one hour was the most cherished hour for me uh, during that period. Um, my parents were, uh, my father was his second son. In fact, we have his photograph here. Um, one of them is my father here. This is my father and this is my older sister. And uh, they believed in, in nonviolence and uh, so they practiced it at home. And like I said in the lecture, that uh, it is a way of life. It is um, how you, you know, practice it in your life. They they didn't punish us when we were misbehaving. When my two sisters and I were children and we misbehaved, they didn't punish us. They did penance, and uh, the penance took the form of fasting. They would fast, depending on how serious the offense was, uh, fast for a day or half a day or, or you know, whatever time. Uh, and they would feed us, they would cook meals, sit at the table, feed us. 
but they would say they are not eating because they were not good parents. They didn't teach us the right way of behavior. And because the relationship between them and us was based on mutual love and respect, we felt awful when that kind of thing happened. And uh, we made sure that it never happened again. But there's a story that I want to share with you when I was about your age. And uh, I had just started driving, 16 years old. And, um, you know, we were living in South Africa in this place where it was way out in the wilderness. All around us was the sugarcane plantation. And um, so when my two sisters and I uh, were growing up, we didn't have anybody our age to relate to and play with and have fun. So we would look for opportunities to go into town and see a movie or visit friends or something. We didn't get those opportunities very frequently because in spite of the fact that it's just 18 miles, in those days driving 18 miles to go and have fun was not a uh, accepted thing. It was too expensive. And uh, so we didn't get those opportunities very frequently. But when we did, we grabbed it. And one Saturday, I remember my dad had to go to town to attend a conference and he didn't feel like driving that day. And uh, he asked me, would you drive me into town? And I jumped at the opportunity and said yes. And since I was going into town, my mom gave me a list of groceries that she needed. And on the way into town, my dad reminded me of all the little chores that had been pending for a long time. And he said, since you have the whole day to yourself, will you please attend to all these chores? Like getting the car serviced and oil changed and all that. And I said, okay. And when I dropped him off at the conference venue, he said, at 5 o'clock in the evening, I will wait for you outside this auditorium. Come and pick me up, and we'll go home together. And I said, okay. And I rushed off, and I did all my chores, and did everything I was expected to do, and uh, bought the groceries and everything, and left the car in the garage with instructions to do whatever was necessary. And being a 16-year-old, I went straight to the nearest movie theater, and I got so engrossed in a John Wayne double feature that I didn't realize the passage of time. The movie ended at 5.30. And I ran from there to the garage and got the car and rushed to where my dad was waiting for me. And I was about an hour late and naturally he was anxious and wondering what happened to me and pacing up and down. And so the first question he asked me is, why are you late? And I was so ashamed to tell him that I was sitting there watching a John Wayne double feature that I lied to him and I said the car wasn't ready, not realizing that he had already called the garage and asked them. And when he caught me in the lie, he said, there's something wrong in the way I brought you up that didn't give you the confidence to tell me the truth that you felt you had to lie to me. And I have to find out where I went wrong with you. And in order to do that, he said, I'm going to walk home 18 miles. I'm not coming with you in the car. There was absolutely nothing I could do to make him change his mind. He just started walking. It was after 6 in the evening. Much of those 18 miles were through sugarcane plantations, dirt roads, late night, no light. I couldn't leave him and go away. So for nearly six hours, I was crawling behind him in the car, watching him go through that pain and agony for a stupid lie that I uttered. And I decided I was never going to lie again. And that was a tremendous lesson in nonviolent parenting. Because if we punish people for misbehavior, I don't think they learn a lesson from it. I think they just suffer the punishment and say, well, this time I was stupid, I got caught. Next time I'll make sure I don't get caught. So the difference here is you're teaching a person, you're changing that person to uh, the lesson rather than just uh, punishing them. 
and uh, it's a lesson that I'll never forget. It, it's a, a very powerful uh, lesson, and that was what nonviolent parenting was, practicing it at home so that we can all learn from it. The worldview today, of course, <laughs> is a mess. Uh, and it's all part of the culture of violence uh, that, uh, you know, has created this mess. Because we are always exploiting each other, everybody individually as well as collectively as nations. Our foreign policy of every nation is based on what is good for them. And what can we get from the rest of the world that we can use for ourselves and we get it. And then those, those who can afford to buy all these things, they just buy it up and, and consume it. And those that can't afford to, they live in poverty. So we have this phenomenon of nearly half of the world living in extreme poverty and the other half of the world in uh, affluence. And so there is the potential for clashes there and, and we see that happening all the time uh, with terrorism and uh, other kinds of violence, even in society. Crime is rampant because we have the disparities uh, and uh, all kinds of things are going on in, in society. So it's very important for us to understand this uh, whole culture of violence and transform it into a culture of nonviolence if we really want to create peace in the world and live as uh, sensible, educated human beings. How oppressive does a government have to be before the people to exercise civil disobedience? I don't think there need to be any uh, oppression uh, at all. I think the sense of justice, uh, we should have that sense of justice. And if something is not right and something is unjust, we should try to find a solution to that and try to find a peaceful solution. And if it doesn't happen, then we have to use uh, uh, methods to transform. And I would like to use this uh, latest uh, you know, conflict that we have in this country uh, of racism, and where we still, in spite of uh, uh, the civil rights being granted, uh, so many years ago, we still have racism and we still have prejudice. And that is because we didn't use the philosophy of nonviolence to its full extent. We thought that by just uh, getting the civil rights laws passed, that integration will take place and everything will be fine. So we did nothing after the 60s when the civil rights laws were passed. Now, the laws can only enable people to be together. But no law on earth can make anybody respect each other if they don't want to. And that is where we are now. The law has enabled everybody to be in the school together, different colors and different races. But there is not that respect that we should have. At least, I don't know in this school, but uh, in many other schools I've been, there's always a conflict between uh, people. So what we, in, in a violent transformation, you know, when we are aggressive, even, uh, you know, without using any physical force, we can be very violent. When we are aggressive, when we try to, uh, shake people by the throat and make them accept us. That way we don't change anybody. We only uh, try to make them uh, be afraid of us. What we want is for people to respect and understand us. And that can happen only through true nonviolent action, which is based in educating the people about the differences in culture rather than uh, shoving it down their throats. You see what I'm trying to get at? We have to reach out to people. We have to understand and try to reach out to people and, and love and expect, uh, respect each other. It's only then that we will be able to get rid of this you know, scourge of 
racism and prejudice that we uh, have, not only in this country, all over the world we have prejudices for one reason or the other. What do I want my legacy to be? Well, I consider myself to be a peace farmer. And I go wherever I get the opportunity to plant seeds of peace. And I got this opportunity today, so I've come here and uh, tried to plant seeds of peace. And I hope that uh, you will all nurture those seeds of peace and, and let it flourish so all of us together can make a difference in this world and make it a better place. But I have done my duty. I've planted the seeds in your mind. Now it's up to you whether you're going to nurture those seeds or let those seeds rot and perish. If my grandfather was alive today, how do you think he would feel about the current situation going on in the world? He would be very unhappy with the situation in the world. But he wasn't one who uh, gave up easily or, uh, or, you know, felt frustrated. He would just, uh, you know, get down and start working again and uh, just realize that uh, more work needs to be done to transform people. And he would just go, get down and do that work and transform. So, you know, frust getting frustrated and giving up was not his way of life. The personal quote that uh, look to when you need advice and help, be the change you want to see. Every time I feel, find myself in a corner or find myself in a conflict, I think of how can I be the change that can resolve this. So that is, uh, I think, the most profound uh, quote. And it's gone viral, and it's just gone all over the world. You know, everybody wants to talk about be the change. The tragedy is everybody wants to talk about it, but nobody wants to practice it. So it's time that we start practicing it rather than just talking about it. What is the best inspirational message advice to give to our group of seniors? Well, I hope that I did give you some uh, encouragement and some incentive. We have to become better than we are. You know, it's not just going to happen um, by itself. It's not going to happen just by getting education. It will only happen when we decide individually, each one of us decide that I am going to be a better person today than I was yesterday. And that was something my grandfather taught me when I was living with him. That every morning you got to get up and tell yourself that I'm going to be a better person today than I was yesterday. And to be able to become a better person, I had to make a list of all my weaknesses. All the things that I considered to be weaknesses in me, I had to make a list of it and begin to work on those weaknesses and transform them into strength. And I still do that. Every day I still do it, in spite of the fact that I'm now almost 82. But I still do it because I still want to be better than I was. And that should be everybody's uh, motive. That we have to become better than we are. And just not through education, but through self-determination. Uh, you are a better person, a better relationships, better understanding of people, better understanding of the world, more compassionate. You know, there are so many people in the world who are suffering and we need to do something to help them. Um, you heard about the Gandhi Institute for Nonviolence that I have started, but there's another institute that I started called the Gandhi Worldwide Education Institute. And that was started because I discovered there are millions of children, uh, much younger than all of you, 
who are living in such abject poverty that they can't even think of going to school and getting an education. I was traveling in a train in Mumbai, India, one day, and I was reading a book, and suddenly I found somebody tugging at my trouser leg, and I looked down, and it was a little kid. I don't think he was more than five years old. He was dressed in rags, dirty, and he had a tin uh, full of homemade candy, and he was imploring me to buy that candy. And I thought to myself, I said, I would not allow my five-year-old kid to be on the train all by himself. What is this kid doing on the train? And so I asked him to get off the station with me, and we sat and talked there. And the story he told me really hurt me so badly that a five-year-old had to go out and work and sell all that candy. And he was told by his parents to sell all the candy and bring money home. Only then he would get something to eat. <coughs> Otherwise, he, he wouldn't get any food to eat. And when I met him, it was almost five past 5 o'clock in the evening. And he still had half a tin full of that candy. And I thought to myself, when is this kid going to sell all these candy? And when is he going to be able to eat anything? I asked him if he had eaten anything since morning, and he says only little pieces of food that he could get on the, in the garbage. And I said, we are in the 20th century. That was last century. And this still happens in the 20th century. How can we tolerate this? How can we be, accept this kind of thing? And so I started this institute to raise money and to provide these, uh, you know, rescue them from poverty and provide them with uh, education and um, uh, some means to, get, to break out of that cycle of poverty. So right now we have more than 700 kids that we have rescued in one institution. I hope that we get enough money so that we can replicate that in other parts of the world and, and try to address the poverty in little ways. And all of us can do this. You know, we don't have to depend on the government or others to do this. All of us can do it if we just take small steps and, and help a few people at a time. I was in a middle school in uh, Portland, Oregon where I spoke to the kids about this whole uh, idea and, the, and this young boy who had to work for a living. <clears throat> and after the talk, the middle school kids uh, all came up to me and they said, we want to do something <clears throat> to help with this program. What can we do? And I said, you get pocket money from your parents every week or day or whatever. But you get the pocket money, and you usually spend that on something that you really don't need. But because you have the money, you go and buy soda or, or buy some candy or whatever. I said, if you decide <clears throat> that you're going to use only half of that money for yourself and save the other half of the money to help somebody somewhere, all of you collectively together can get so much money. And they took up this challenge. The teachers helped them. And within a few months, they sent me a check of $7,000. 200 kids, they save, and they still continue to do that. And the, the purpose in this was twofold, not just to get the money for these poor kids, but to make those kids who were giving realize that they had a responsibility and they had to awaken their conscience, their compassion, so that they could help the people. And in small ways, we can make that kind of a difference.
now I've run out of questions. <laughs> <laughs> any of you have any questions? No? No questions mean no inspiration. On behalf of the students and staff here at Integrated Arts and Technology High School, we would like to give you a token of our appreciation for coming to speak to us today. You've all benefited and learned from your values, from your valuable lessons, and your grandfather's message and word. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you all. If you guys want to come up front, we're going to get a group chat. Come on up. Where would you like to be? Would you like to sit or would you like to stand? And they'll kind of kind of rotate around you. We'll have some of the balance, some on this side, half over here. We want to have some in the front. You do? I can sit. Guys at the back, so can come up here. Come sit down. Come sit down. Yeah. Thank you. Come from front, 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 front of the table. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. She, she doesn't want to be seen. <laughs> One in the yearbook. <laughs> <laughs> um, real quick, I just want to give a, a thank you to a few people that are in the room today. Um, I actually attended an event that Mr. Rungandi went to and spoke at, and um, we have the White family here from Breathe Yoga Studio. They brought him to breathe, and that's how I was able to make that connection with him here today. So <laughs> and I want to give a shout out to Miss Port. She 
you did an awesome job of setting up the Cyber Lounge today. <laughs> She is our school designer, and she has done a lot of work outside of um, the school day, getting us ready and helping us out. So, I have to say, okay, go ahead. My name is Lisa Butler. I'm their school counselor, and I have never seen these guys work so hard before in my life. They have something called senioritis right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even the best and the brightest in this building do, I think. And for, for Mr. Parko and for you, they pulled it together and done some amazing things. And I honestly have to say, I'm so proud of you guys. And this kind of hard work on with you after this. Yeah. Please. <laughs> They're going to start a capstone project. Mm -hmm. We're going to introduce it to them today. And they'll be presenting it in June. And they'll be using what you said today and the um, message from your grandfather and the research that they've gathered to include that in their capstone project. So if you would like to come back in June and see their presentation, um, we'll, we'll set that up. That would be great. I know they would love to have you come back in. When you guys exit the room, can you leave your clipboards on your chair? We're going to bring your graphic organizer with you, and then remember you're coming back to Ms. Mundorf's room for first period. Yeah, he was assassinated, and I he was assassinated two months after I left him. So uh, I was initially very angry, and I expressed my anger to my parents. And I said, if I was there, I would have throttled the person who assassinated him. And my parents said that that was not what he tried to teach you. And taught you that you were to be more um, constructive and positive in your in the use of anger. So they taught me how to forgive and, and dedicate my life to see that this kind of violence is reduced in society. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Hi. Oh, sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. So that's why when you looked at me and said, How much time do we have? I'm like, We're in really good shape. <laughs>
this comes up, right? Yeah. And does this go in here or just out here? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. that's okay. 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 oh, there's another group coming in? Yeah. Oh, shoot! <laughs> I'm sorry. Put that back on. Oh, jeez. No, not that. In the bottom. I, th I thought it was kind of early to um, end. Do you need to use the bathroom or anything? No, I'm fine. That's not okay. Do you want to I'll put that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Where did you get all these pictures from? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We grab some of them right off images, right off online. We just put images yeah. in there, and then we have a poster board mm -hmm. in here that they can pull up all these things up. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. This picture is my sister, my uh, father. Well, I know Melinda, we're done. Is that something you want to take with you? Yeah. Sorry, I just need to test the microphone real quickly. Testing. Is it? Well, no, it's supposed to be so that no matter where you're sitting, you should be able to hear it, but we think it might have gotten knocked by one of our students. So. Oh, no, it's, it actually came out pretty good, but at the end it started getting a little crinkly.
Now. Good morning. My name is Luis Montes, and I'm the vice president of the Community Fund. Hello, students and guests. Welcome to this very interesting program. We would like to take a moment to introduce our guest speaker, who was born in South Africa, and is an Indian American social political activist, speaker, author, and agent of change. He is the fifth grandson of legendary leader Mahatma Gandhi. Good morning. My name is Amy Anna Howard, and I'm president of the senior class. Mr. Mungami is a very popular speaker on climate change and has spoken in China, Japan, and France, and many other countries around the world. In recent years, he has shared his grandfather's message with government officials, such as President Clinton, and even at new events and organizations. His programs have helped change the lives of over half a million people in their continuous to go to. To be the change you want to see in the world. Good morning. My name is Greg Joseph, and our speaker has committed his life to being the change he wants to see in the world. Mr. Gandhi founded the Gandhi Worldwide Education, a nonprofit organization that has worked that works to realize the vision of this sort of nation. The institution's mission is to help individuals and communities develop the inner resources and particular skills needed to achieve a nonviolent, sustainable, and just world. The MK Gandhi Institute of Nonviolence is located at the University of Russia. He has several honorary degrees and has participated in notable interfaith activities. Mr. Gandhi has dedicated his life to continuing the work that his grandfather, Muhammad Gandhi, began. It is my great honor and privilege to introduce Arun Gandhi. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here this morning with all of you to share uh, with you some of my experiences as well as to inspire you to do something good in life so that we can make this world a better place. Um, I'm sure all of you are um, stunned by all the violence that we see that is going on not only in our cities but uh, even in the world and and uh, it's just escalating and growing and it's shocking uh, the extent of violence that we have become so uh, accustomed to. And this doesn't have to be like this. We have to create the atmosphere where all of us can live in harmony and peace uh, together instead of uh, fighting each other. And that is the whole idea of the philosophy of nonviolence that my grandfather uh, practiced and uh, developed in his life. Unfortunately, we didn't quite understand the philosophy uh, and so everybody used it as a weapon, uh, as a tool, uh, and uh, so, you know, it, it serves only half the purpose. And uh, if we make it a part of our life, which is what he expected us to do, make it a part of our life, be committed to nonviolence and live nonviolence, then 
we would be able to create that kind of atmosphere where we would be able to get rid of all the prejudices and hate and, and so on that we have in the world today. I grew up uh, in that kind of an atmosphere in South Africa. Um, when I was growing up, they had apartheid, which was legalized uh, prejudice and pre legalized discrimination. And um, so everybody hated everybody else. Uh, and I was um, bullied and beaten up uh, by blacks and whites in South Africa because I didn't fit into either of the color schemes. For the whites, I was too black, and for the blacks, I was too white. And so I was constantly being beaten and bullied and, and uh, uh, you know, really abused. And normally, my natural reaction was the same reaction that all of us have. I became angry. I wanted to fight back again. I went to the gymnasium, started working on becoming strong so that I could fight back. And that is when my parents took me to India and, uh, and taught me um, uh, and, and gave me the opportunity to live with grandfather and, and learn something from him. And the very first lesson that my grandfather taught me was understanding anger and being able to channel that energy constructively. Now we all get angry for one reason or the other, but because we haven't been taught about this, we just abuse the anger and we say things and do things that sometimes changes the course of our lives completely. Today our prison systems are filled with young people who acted in a moment of madness. And that moment of madness has changed their lives so drastically that they'll never be the same again. And yet it didn't have to be. If we can learn about anger and learn how to channel that emotion constructively and positively, we would be uh, much better off and better human beings and uh, serve the people much better. He taught me that anger is like electricity. It's just as useful and just as powerful, but only if we use it intelligently. But it can be just as deadly and destructive if we abuse it. So just as we channel electrical energy and bring it into our lives and use it for the good of humanity, we must learn to channel anger in the same way so that we can use that energy for the good of humanity rather than abuse it and cause death and destruction. He suggested that I write an anger journal. He said, every time you get angry about something, don't act on it, don't say anything or do anything that is going to change the course of your life but write the journal with the intention of finding a solution to the problem and then commit yourself to finding a solution. Now that is very important because today a lot of people tell me they have been writing an anger journal for a long time but it hasn't really helped them because they simply pour their anger out into the journal so every time they go back and read the journal they are just reminded of the incident and they get angry all over again. So it doesn't make any sense to simply pour your anger out into the journal. But it makes a lot of sense to write the journal with the intention of finding a solution and then commit yourself to finding that solution. I did this for many years and I must say it helped me considerably in learning how to use my anger constructively and positively. We all get angry. There's nothing wrong with it. Anger is a very powerful emotion. It is to the human beings what gas is to the automobile. If we don't put gas in the automobile, it's not going to run. If we don't have anger, we are not going to function and do the things that we should be doing. What is bad is the way we abuse anger. And we need to learn how to use that energy positively and constructively. So I've been one of those who've been talking about um, anger management classes right from the elementary school all the way up to the university level. We need to teach this to young people so that they can be better equipped to deal with anger when the time comes. I hope someday it will happen. 
and people will learn uh, about anger management because today experts tell us that more than 80% of the violence that we experience is generated by anger individually or collectively it's people get angry and they just blow up and they do things and and you know we have all kinds of situations uh, created by that and yet it doesn't have to be we can learn to use that and if we all learn to use our anger uh, intelligently and and uh, constructively we will be able to reduce the level of violence very substantially in our lives imagine 85 percent of the violence we can reduce even if we reduce it by half it will be such a peaceful place to live in so anger management was the first very important lesson that I learned from my grandfather the second very important lesson I learned from him was about building relationships today our relationships with each other are based on self-interest we're always thinking about what am I going to get from this relationship and if I don't get anything from it why should I bother to have a relationship and that is a very selfish way of building a relationship a relationship ideally should be built on the four principles of respect understanding acceptance and appreciation we have to respect ourselves and respect each other and respect our connection with all of creation you know, we have to remember we are not independent individuals we can't do whatever we like and it's nobody's business whatever we do impact somebody else somewhere and whatever they do impacts us so we are all interdependent interconnected and interrelated not only as human beings but with all of creation it's only when we respect that that we will understand who we are and what we are and why are we here on earth we are not here just to pass the time of day we are all here for a purpose but we have to discover what that purpose is there's nobody who can tell you what that purpose is you have to find out for yourself what that purpose is and the one important purpose in our life here is to make a community that we can be proud of that we live in a community and we make that community in, in a community that we are all proud of and that takes a lot of um, work to do that it doesn't happen on its own building a community building a whole, that is one of the purposes in in our life so when we understand that purpose then we will be able to accept each other as human beings and not identify people by the the labels we have put upon ourselves today we identify people by labels by race labels and color labels and uh, religious labels and economic labels and gender labels and you name it and we have a label and when we start identifying people by labels we are building a wall between that person and ourselves and every time we build a wall between people it's a potential for conflict so we have to build break down those walls and just start looking at each other as human beings it doesn't matter which race we belong to or which religion we follow or what color is our skin we are all human beings and it's only when we start looking that way at, at each other and treating each other as human beings that we will be then able to appreciate our own humanity so it's important for us to learn uh, this because nonviolence as I said earlier is not a tool it's not a weapon that you can use at one moment and discard the next moment it's a way of life it is something that we have to live and make a part of our our whole life here. the other lesson that I learned from him which made a very big impact on my life was uh, about the depth and the breadth of his philosophy of nonviolence 
Until that day, I had thought that nonviolence was just another way of resolving conflicts. But that day, I learned that it's much more than that. And it ha all happened through a little pencil, a little three-inch butt of a pencil, which I threw away because I, I thought I needed a better pencil, a longer pencil. And uh, that evening when I met grandfather and asked him for a new pencil, instead of giving me one, he subjected me to a lot of questions. He wanted to know how the pencil became small and where did I throw it away and why did I throw it away and on and on and on. And I couldn't understand why he was making such a fuss over the little pencil until he told me to go out and look for it. And I said, you must be joking. He said, you don't expect me to look for a little pencil in the dark? He said, oh, yes, I do. Here's a flashlight. And he sent me out with the flashlight, and I think I must have spent about two hours searching for that pencil. And when I finally found it and brought it to him, he said, now I want you to sit here and learn two very important lessons. The first lesson he was that even in the making of a simple thing like a pencil, we use a lot of the world's natural resources. And when we throw them away, we are throwing away the world's natural resources. And that is violence against nature. And the second lesson is that because in an affluent society we can afford to buy all these things in bulk, we overconsume the resources of the world. And because we overconsume them, we are depriving people elsewhere of these resources, and they have to live in poverty, and that is violence against humanity. Now, that was the first time I realized that all of these things that we do every day, consciously and unconsciously, things that have become so much a part of our life, that we destroy and throw away and, and waste because we have so much of it, that every time we indulge in any of those actions, we are indulging in violence, either physical violence or passive violence. Now, physical violence is, you know, where we use physical force against people, all the fighting and beating and kill kicking and punching and slapping and murders and rapes and wars and all of these things where we use physical force against people with physical violence. But there is something called passive violence, where we don't use any physical force, and yet we hurt people, directly or indirectly. And sometimes we don't even see these people, and they could be in another country, and yet we hurt them by the way we live or by the way we behave. And that is the more insidious type of violence, because that all of us are committing all the time. So if you say to me today that I'm not violent because I don't go out and fight with people, you're wrong. Because you are violent in the passive sense. We are all violent in the passive sense. We are always wasting things and throwing away things and destroying things because we have an abundance of it. I was appalled to read in the New York Times not very long ago that in the United States alone, we throw away $20 billion worth of food every year. $20 billion worth of food, perfectly good food, goes down the drain every year. When there are millions of people in our own country here who don't get enough to eat let alone all the people around the world who are starving. Now that is the greatest form of violence that we practice. Every day when we have our meals and we throw away part of the meals because we are too full or we have taken too much or we don't like it and we just throw it away, that is violence. And so that passive violence is something that we have to recognizes and find, find out for ourselves how are we committing this passive violence. It's so alien, the whole concept is so alien that we don't even recognize it. And to make me understand this, he made me draw a genealogical tree of violence. You know, like you do a family tree? Have you all done a family tree? You've seen one? 
with the grandparents and the parents and then the children and so on. Well, he made me draw a tree like that of violence, with violence as the grandparent and physical violence and passive violence as the two branches. And every day before I went to bed, I had to analyze and examine everything that I had experienced during the day and put them down on that tree. Now physical violence, as I explained to you, is all the kinds of violence where physical force is used. And that would go under physical violence. And that is limited because there's a limited amount of physical force that we can use. But the passive violence, like I said, is insidious. It's so um, unknown that we practice it without knowing it, that we are being violent. All the things like discrimination, looking down on people, teasing people, uh, wasting resources, over-consuming resources, the hundreds and hundreds of things that we do every day, consciously and unconsciously. All of that is passive violence. And when I began to do this introspection, of my own uh, life. I was amazed that within a few months I was able to fill up the whole wall in my room with acts of passive violence. And then he explained to me the connection between the two. He said, we commit passive violence all the time, every day, consciously and unconsciously, and that generates anger in the victim, and the victim then resorts to physical violence to get justice. Because that's what justice has come to mean today. That somebody who denied us something or done something wrong, that person needs to be punished. So then we have this collective justice and, and terrorism and crime and, and all that keeps increasing in societies. It's all because of that passive violence. So if we don't recognize that passive violence and don't make the changes in our life, we are never going to be able to create peace because passive violence is the fuel that ignites the physical violence. So logically, if we want to put out that fire of physical violence, we have to cut off the fuel supply. And since the fuel supply comes from each one of us, we have to become the change we wish to see in the world. It's only when we change and, and improve our uh, behavior and our relationships and, and so on, that we will then be able to create harmony in, in the c community and we will be able to live in peace with each other. Until then, we are going to fight like cats and dogs and, and create more and more violence which destroys us. Because every time there's a violence in our own neighborhood, in our own society, it destroys us not just physically, but even spiritually, destroys our uh, humanity. And we don't want that. We don't want that kind of society. We want to have a society where we can all live in harmony and, and uh, love and respect for each other. We have to learn to respect each other, not tolerate each other. That is something that really I, I find very uh, abusive. I, I even despise that word tolerance because that is not the kind of relationship we want between people. We want one that is respectful, not tolerating. Tolerance means that we, you know, we can't do anything about it, so we're going to tolerate the person who's there in the room with us. And that is not the relationship we want. We want to be able to respect all the people who are with us and, and honor them and respect them and understand them. So that is the kind of relationship that my grandfather talked about building and, and creating peace in the world in there. And of course, he would be very pained by what he would see in the world today with all the violence and the increasing violence and the terrorism and, and the lack of respect for life and all the things that we do to each other, which is just inhuman. Every day when I read these violent uh, situations, I 
I am appalled that in to the, of the in humanity that it is creating here, and we have to uh, learn to deal with that. He was a very positive thinking person. Oh, even though he would feel disappointed with the state of the world today, he wouldn't be frustrated and he wouldn't give up doing anything. He would just get down and start working and changing people one person at a time. And that's what all of us need to do. You know, we can't have a miracle. We don't see to wave a wand and make everybody peaceful. I wish we did have that capacity, but we don't. So the first thing we have to do is we must become the change. And after becoming the change, we make that ripple grow uh, around us and, and incorporate uh, our families and our friends and our colleagues and our, uh, everybody in society. And it's through that kind of ripple effect that eventually the world is going to change. We have built a whole culture of violence a culture that has seeped so deeply into us that it has overwhelmed every aspect of our lives. Our sports has become violent, our language is violent, our entertainment is violent, our music is violent, our everything about us, everything is violent. And it's in that culture of violence that we encourage more violence and destruction. So you've got to dismantle that culture of violence and replace it with a culture of nonviolence, which doesn't mean that we become doormats, that we allow everybody to walk all over us. There. We do stand up uh, for justice and for rights, for not only for ourselves, but for all the people around us. But we do it peacefully and nonviolently because we want to transform the person and change that person rather than punish that person. Punishment doesn't change anybody. It doesn't help anybody. It only aggravates the situation. It's only transforming the person that uh, makes a difference. You know, I like to give you an example of my grandfather when he uh, was in South Africa and uh, he was beaten up and almost lynched by a mob of white uh, young people. And then the police came and saved him and the police were able to arrest some four or five of the, the main culprits who were uh, attempting to lynch him. And uh, they asked grandfather to come to the police station and file a case against them so that uh, they could be punished. And grandfather came to the police station and in the presence of the culprits, he told the police, he says, I don't want to punish them. He said, I don't care if they walk out of this prison without any punishment. I w I've already forgiven them for what they have done. And I want them to realize that what they did was wrong and uh, that they need to transform themselves. The police said that we'll have to release them and go, let them go if you don't file a case. He said, that's fine. And all those people went away without being punished. But that act of forgiving and, and kindness that my grandfather showed to them made three of those five people join him in, uh, in his uh, work against the uh, racism in South Africa. And the other two, although they didn't join him, but they, their lives were transformed and they changed from their habits. So it was that kind of thing that we need to think about. We want to change the person, we want to transform the person, not just punish the person and, and uh, radicalize that person. So it's very important to understand this aspect of nonviolence so that we can make that difference in people's lives. So the next question is about oppressive, how oppressive does a government have to be before we exercise our rights? It doesn't have to be very oppressive. It's a question of justice. Even simple injustice should not be tolerated. 
it should be removed. We need, we need to uh, do something to remove that injustice, but not in a violent way, not in an aggressive way. Um, and I'd like to give the example of what's happening in the country today with racism and uh, Black Lives Matter and, and those things which are uh, movements that are necessary uh, to bring about better relationships but unfortunately the movements are not following entirely in the peaceful uh, way. So it, it's a, you know, even aggressiveness and when we are being aggressive towards uh, other people and demanding uh, things, it doesn't really <clears throat> bring about a change. Now, for instance, the, the the whole movement that took place in the University of Missouri, where they um, protested and and got the president of the uh, university to resign. Well, he resigned. But how is that going to affect the pre prejudice that exists in in the university? I don't know. You know, things as it's going to be somebody else will come, and that prejudice that exists in people's minds is going to remain there. So what we have to do is to focus on the problem and not the person. We have to focus on the problem of prejudice that exists in the minds of people and we have to remove those prejudices and start looking at each other as human beings and transform people as human beings. So these are things that we must be conscious of. Uh, the legacy that I got from him is the legacy of nonviolence. What I have learned from him and understood from him about the practice of nonviolence that we have to do it at home, we have to do it with our children, we have to do it with ourselves, and uh, do it with all the people uh, that we meet and, and come in contact with. So even when we abuse ourselves with drugs and and you know, smoking cigarettes and, and so on, that is a form of violence. We are doing it to ourselves, but it is violence. And it doesn't help anybody. You only destroy your own life there. And your life matters. Everybody's life matters. And we need to uh, be conscious of our role in, in society and how we can uh, become better human beings. And that was a very powerful lesson that I learned from grandfather when he told me that I, every morning when I get up, I've got to tell myself I'm going to be a better person today than I was yesterday. And being a better person is not simply just getting a better education or going to college or, or uh, you know, the normal things. That is only part of becoming a better person. You can only become truly better when you decide that you are going to transform all your weaknesses into strengths. And then you make this commitment every morning when you get up. And to be able to fulfill that commitment, you've got to make a list of all the weaknesses that you consider in your character. And then start working on those weaknesses to transform them into strengths. I did this and I still do it continuously every day. It's a lifelong experience, a lifelong thing that we have to do all the time, that we have to be a better person. And every day I look at the weaknesses in myself and change those weaknesses into strengths. And I hope that all of you will uh, do the same thing so that all of us can uh, together make a difference in this world and make it a better place for future generations. If my grandfather was alive today, how do you think he would feel about the current situation? I already answered that question. I think he, he would be very unhappy, but he would start working and transforming people. The personal quote that I like the most and uh, I think is, be the change you want to see in the world. It's a very powerful quotation. It's a very powerful word. If we don't change, the world is not going to change. 
And so we have to become the change that we wish to see. And that is also uh, very inspirational. It, it makes us uh, look at ourselves and, and transform, transform ourselves before we transform the world there. I think I've answered most of your questions. I, I want to um, perhaps share with you, do we have time still? Um, I want to share with you a couple of stories that illustrate uh, what I meant by practicing nonviolence. I grew up in a, in a home where my parents believed in nonviolence. And they nonviolence has no room for punishment. It's always penance. And so when my two sisters and I were growing up, uh, when we misbehaved or did something wrong, they didn't punish us. They did penance instead. And the penance took the form of fasting. Depending on how serious the offense was, they would fast for a day or fast for two days. But they would cook the meals, they would sit at the dining table, they would feed us, and they would tell us that they are not eating because they were not good parents. They didn't teach us the right way of behavior. And because the relationship between them and us was built on mutual love and respect, we felt awful when they had to do that kind of thing. And we made sure that they never did, we never did it again. There's another story that I want to share when I was 16 years old and I just started driving. And we were living in South Africa and in a very remote place um, in the midst of sugarcane plantations. All around us, all I could see was sugarcane plantations and we were a kind of an island in the midst of all, the, all of that. And so naturally we didn't have any friends and uh, you know, our age to play with and have fun. And uh, so we would look forward to going into town and, uh, and visiting friends and seeing a movie and all that. But although it, the town was just 18 miles away, in those days driving 18 miles to go and have fun was impossible. It was not something practical at all. It was too expensive. So we didn't get those opportunities on, except on special occasions. And one Saturday happened to be that special occasion, for me at least. My dad had to go to town to attend a conference and he didn't feel like driving that day. And so he asked me if I would drive him into town and I jumped at the opportunity and said yes. And since I was going into town, my you know, mom gave me a list of groceries that she needed and on the way into town, my dad reminded me of all the chores that had been pending for a long time, like getting the car serviced and oil changed and all that. And he said, since you have the whole day to yourself, will you please attend to all this? And I said, fine. And I rushed off and I did all my chores and uh, bought all the groceries. And being a 16 year old, I went straight to the nearest movie theater. And I forgot that my, my dad had asked me to come and pick him up at five o'clock in the evening. I was just so engrossed in that John Wayne double feature that uh, the movie ended at 5.30. And I got out and ran from there and went to the garage and got the car and rushed to where my dad was waiting. And he was naturally anxious and wondering what happened to me and he was pacing up and down. And so the first question he asked me is, why are you late? And instead of telling him the truth, I was so ashamed to tell him that I was sitting there watching a John Wayne double feature that I lied to him and I said the car wasn't ready, not realizing that he had already called the garage and asked them. And when he caught me in the lie, he said there's something wrong in the way I brought you up that didn't give you the courage to tell me the truth and that you felt you had to lie to me. And I've got to find out where I went wrong with you and in order to do that, he said, I'm going to walk home 18 miles. I'm not coming with you in the car. There was absolutely nothing I could do to make him change his mind. He just started walking. It was 
past six o'clock in the evening. Much of those 18 miles were through sugarcane plantations, dirt roads, late night, no lights. I couldn't leave him and go away. So for nearly six hours, I was crawling behind him in the car, watching him go through that pain and agony of the, for the stupid lie that I uttered. And I decided there and then that I was never going to lie again. And I think that was a very profound lesson in nonviolent parenting. If he had punished me the way pi parents would do today, I don't think I would have learned the lesson. I think I would have just suffered the punishment and made sure the next time I don't get caught. But by taking the responsibility on himself and, and doing penance for something that I did, he taught me such a powerful lesson that it remains with me even till today. And that is the, the power of nonviolence. It is through love that we transform the other person and, and change the other person, not through brute force. We don't change anybody through brute force. We beat up on each other, but they don't change. They live in fear for a little while because you are stronger than them. But sooner or later that fear wears off and they, they retaliate and then you have a whole situation that you can't control. So th these are things that we have to uh, remember. And um, the last qu uh, story that I want to share was a story that my grandfather used to be very fond of telling us of an ancient Indian king who once became very curious about the meaning of peace. And he invited all the intellectuals in his kingdom to come and explain. And everybody came and did their best, but nobody could satisfy the king. And then there was an intellectual from another town who came on a visit, and the king asked him to explain the meaning of peace. And he said, the only person who can give you a satisfactory answer is an old sage who lives outside your kingdom. But he is so old that he cannot come to you. You will have to go to him and ask him this question. So the next day the king went to this home of the sage and asked him the meaning of peace. And he quietly went to the back of the house and came back with a grain of wheat and placed that grain of wheat on the king's palm and said, here is your answer. And of course the king didn't know what a grain of wheat had to do with peace. And he didn't want to show his ignorance. So he quietly clutched that grain of wheat and went back to his palace, found a little gold box, and he placed that grain of wheat in the box. And every morning he would open that box to look for an answer, and he couldn't find any answer. So when this intellectual came back on a return visit, the king asked him to explain. He said, you sent me to the sage, and he gave me this grain of wheat, and I don't know what a grain of wheat has to do with peace. And that's when this intellectual said it's very simple. He said, as long as you keep this grain of wheat in this box, nothing is going to happen. It will eventually rot and perish, and that will be the end of the story. But if you had allowed this grain of wheat to grow and in, interact with all the elements, if you had planted this seed outside in the soil, it would sprout and grow and very soon you could have a whole field of wheat. And that is the meaning of peace. And if somebody has found peace and if they keep it locked up in their hearts for themselves, it is going to perish with them. But if they let it interact with all the elements, it would sprout and grow and very soon we could have a whole world of peacemakers. So I've come here this morning to give you the grain of wheat I got from my grandfather. And I hope that you won't let it rot and perish, but let it interact so that all of us together can change this world and make it a better place for future generations. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I also wanted to show you this. Uh, this is one of the things that he designed. And uh, 
made because you know india uh, during his time was very poor and the reason for the poverty was that uh, the british were taking away the indian cotton to britain making cloth there and then selling it back to the indian people at a very exorbitant price and so the indian people just became more and more poor they couldn't afford to buy clothes and so grandfather felt that uh, the f before political independence the indian people need to have economic independence and the way he decided to create this economic independence was to empower people even little children to use this machine to make cotton threads and that those cotton threads could then be woven into cloth like this and this, this is all handmade and woven and uh, you know, spun and uh, made by hand and so it became a cottage industry in india and every family started making uh, their own cloths with the, their cotton so he designed this uh, little contraption uh, which is very inexpensive and very easy for people to use and um, become independent so i brought it here because this is one thing that i have um, as in his memory and i also brought these two uh, metal glasses this one was used by grandfather to drink water and things and this was used by grandmother in those days they used these metal uh, stuff because it was easier and less expensive glass was very expensive in those days and the glass would break very often so replacing it would be a cost so they used these metal things and i believe these glasses are made of five different metals uh, don't ask me the names of the metals <laughs> but uh, it, it is understood in the indian tradition that they, it's very healthy to drink out of um, these glasses that are made of five different metals now if you want me to demonstrate how this works i'll need one of you who is strong to come and hold the thing for me yeah, i'll show you let me get in place Okay, just hold it firmly so it doesn't shake because I'm going to turn this. See how it thread is made? Easy, isn't it? Ask her how easy it is. <laughs> Anybody want to try? I've done drops during the war. I know how to make it turn. How do you make it turn? I have to send it to India to get it woven. <laughs> <laughs> you have to turn this and pull that. Uh, turn and pull? Yeah. Okay, this way? Yeah. <laughs> 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 
the text group? Mm, yeah, me too. You're not pulling. I've done it all my life. <laughs> this was something that grandfather insisted all of us do. Yeah. It's very, uh, very calming and meditative. You, know, you have to concentrate on it, and uh, so when your mind is agitated, it won't work. You have to be <laughs> calm, and uh, then it works, and it makes you calmer. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, yeah. So, any questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Chris, you said that like you talked about some like prejudice and like all over. What made you decide? I, I consider everybody to be important, whether you're a student or a president, it doesn't make a difference. You are just as important to me as President Clinton was when I talked to him. Out of all the different places you've traveled to and all the different people you talked to, where do you think had the biggest impact? Where did I have been? Where do you think you or your, like, your message and your teachings had the biggest impact? Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, I find uh, these days whenever I go, there are more and more people coming to the talk. So it gives me the feeling that more people resonate with what I'm saying and, and they want to listen to more of it. And so um, that's an encouraging thing. But I think it's the impact is the same anywhere, whether it's a small group like this or whether it's a large group of thousand people, it's the same impact. And, uh, you know, it doesn't make any qualitative difference. I mean, uh, just able to plant seeds in the mind of a thousand people at one time or ten people at one time, it's the same thing. Yeah. What do you think we as Buddhists can do to change the world? Change yourself and help other people around you change and let that ripple effect grow. And also be conscious of the pain and agony. Like I said to the other group, you know, I was at, um, I, I have been always very disturbed by the level of poverty that exists all around the world and especially among children who uh, and they have to live in that cycle of poverty and can't get out of it. I was traveling in a train in Mumbai, India, and I was reading a book and I suddenly found somebody tugging at my trouser leg. And it looked, it was a little boy, he was just about five years old, I think. He was in, dressed in rags, he was dirty, he had a little tin can full of homemade candy, and he was trying to sell that to me. And I was intrigued because I wouldn't allow my five-year-old kid to be traveling alone in a train in, in the city. And so I called, asked him to get off the train and, and uh, we sat on the station and talked. And the story he told me was really painful. He said every day he was sent out of the home early in the morning with a tin full of candy that his mother made with instructions that he had to bring back all the money and only then he would be given something to eat. Until then, he wouldn't get any food at all. And uh, when I met him, 
he was about five o'clock in the evening, right? And he still had about half a tin full of candy. And I didn't know when he was going to be able to sell all that candy and eat something. And that's when I realized that how can this happen? And this was in the last century, last uh, And I said, how can this happen in the 20th century? I mean, you know, we are supposed to be progressive, and, and yet little kids at the age of five have to make a living. And he said the whole day he had not eaten anything except little pieces of food that he picked up in the garbage. Now, how can we tolerate that kind of thing? And so I created an institution where I raise money and, uh, and rescue these children and give them uh, some hope, some education, and uh, uh, you know, give them the means to break out of that cycle of poverty. Right now we have more than 700 kids in one institution in uh, India. And I'm hoping to be able to raise more money so that I can have more institutions in other parts of the world too, <clears throat> especially in Africa. There's a lot of uh, ignorance and poverty and destitution there too. So I'm doing that, and uh, I was, you know, I told the other group uh, I was in Portland, Oregon, not long ago, and I spoke to a middle school. There were some 200 odd kids in the middle school. And I told them about the story. And at the end of it, they all came up to me and said, we want to do something uh, to help this situation. What can we do? And I said, well, uh, you know, all of you get uh, pocket money from your parents. And you usually spend that pocket money on something useless that you don't really need. But you buy it only because you have the money. Maybe candy or soda or something like that. And I said, if you decide, all of you collectively, decide that you are not going to spend all that money for yourself, just spend half of it for yourself and save the other half for some uh, poor person somewhere. And collectively, you can make a very big difference. And they took up this challenge. And within a few months, I think it was about seven or eight months, they raised about $7,000 to help with this institution. And they continue to do uh, little things like that all the time. So it had two effects. First effect was to help somebody uh, living in poverty. And the second was uh, that it taught them the value of compassion, that they can make these small sacrifices and yet they make a big difference in people's lives. So if all of us decide to do something like that, a small step in the right direction can make a very big difference in somebody's life somewhere. And this is a perfect segue into something we have to present to you. So what we'd like to present you is um, a special token as a thank my ambassadors from us. My name is Felicia Glass, and I would like to present to you a thank you card that is a drawing of you and your grandfather, drawn by me, as well as a commitment to 100 hours of community service at the Ghana Institute by the IOT seniors. We are currently working with Kent Miller to design a meaningful service project. Thank you once again for coming out and sharing your message with us today. No, thank you very much. Thank Thank you very much. And I also wanted to commend all of you, whoever is responsible for making this wonderful display here. It took a lot of work and a lot of uh, effort. Uh, and did a great, great job. Thank you. Come on up. Thank you. 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 Thank you.